Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. guest has worked with NCAA athletes, the U.S. Department of Defense, Olympic gold medalists, and he has implemented one of the first sports science program in the NFL. Please welcome the founder and CEO of AIM-7, Dr. Eric Corum. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Dr. Eric Corum. How are we doing? I'm doing great. I'm really thankful for the opportunity to be here. I'm excited because this is this is kind of new. I don't think we actually had an entrepreneur that really focuses on what we're going to be talking about today. But before mm-hmm. we get into AIM-7, give us mm-hmm. a little background. Yeah, so I've been married for 14 years. I've got three boys. Um, grew up in Texas in the Dallas area. But then I spent about 16 years in the NFL and in college football working as a sports scientist. Um, my career really hit an inflection point in 2011, and I pioneered the use of athlete wearable tracking technology when I was at Florida State University. So for the first time ever, we were able to quantify what was going on in the game. We were putting these GPS, we had these devices that were attached to the athletes that connected to GPS satellites and crazy stuff. And um, we were able to take millions of data points and turn them into actionable recommendations to help our team improve their performance, reduce injuries. The next season, we had an 88% reduction in injury. The NFL flew in, was like, okay, what's happening? This opened a multi-billion dollar market for sports wearable and data here in the U.S. And so um, I went on to the University of Kentucky from there. I was a director of performance. I got a PhD uh, studying how sleep impacts our ability to adapt to stress, ended up going on to work in the NFL. And that was all before AIM-7. Wow. Wow. You know, it's kind of funny you mentioned Florida State. I grew up a huge Seminoles fan, just (laughs) diehard Charlie Ward, Dean Sanders, you know, just just the Chris Winkie also won a good old Heisman over there. I actually went to watch Jameis Winston play. But before, enough about Florida State. Let's yeah. talk about AIM-7. So how did how did you kind of get to this point? Well, first, how did you get into the sports, um, the, the sports science of it? How did you get into this? Well, sports science didn't exist when I started this. In the U.S., let me restate that. I was at Florida State. Uh, my background was as a traditional strength and conditioning coach, and I'd worked in with a number of Olympic gold medalists in the sprint events, so I'd had the opportunity to travel the world, a lot of Jamaican sprinters. And um, when I was at Florida State, Coach Fisher asked me after my first season if I'd be the director of football operations. It's essentially like being a GM. And I'm like, okay, but would you also name me director of sports science? He's like, uh, yeah, call yourself whatever you want. <laughs> He didn't know what I wanted to do. I went to Australia for about a month to learn about the emerging world of sports science and athlete wearables. So I brought that back and I was when when this whole thing went down, it, it was there are a few times when you really have an opportunity to you don't realize you're pioneering something or changing the way things are going to be done forever. But now if you ever watch an NFL game like AWS Next Gen Stats, all of that came out of this little hub. And, um, so that's what got me into sports science was the, was the tracking of the, of the athlete data. And then we started, you know, getting more sophisticated with biometrics, uh, even biomarkers, um, really learning from our colleagues in Australia and in Europe. And then now in the U S almost every major sports program has a data, a sports scientist. So fortunately I was the first. You know, one of the first, I have a, a colleague who's an MLS. I would say Dave Tinney was also, he and I kind of started at the same time. Unfortunately, you also, you know, make a lot of mistakes, you know, and uh, I got the scar tissue and uh, from, from making early mistakes, which has benefited me now in AIM-7 in a different market. You know, let, let's take a step back real quick for, for the listeners. 
what in the hell is sports science? Let's let's <laughs> what is sports science? Yeah, sports science is essentially like uh, using data, understand like reverse engineering the game, whatever game it is. And really what I was involved in was, was high performance, which is like understanding that every, every athletic endeavor has a physical side, a technical side, a tactical side, and an intellectual or psychological side. And sports science is you're really using data and other things to understand, you know, what is driving excellence or performance. And so you reverse engineer what elite is and you can break it down at all of its constituent parts and you can build that up to create a winning formula for your team. And so sports science, they're the people that are, it's just like a biologist, right? You're, you're looking at the data, you're interpreting that data. You come up with a hypothesis, you test that hypothesis, like what makes a team faster, what allows a team to an athlete to show up rested and recovered for game day. What's driving injuries. Okay. Now let's collect data and understand like what could be the contributing factors. And then, then hopefully you come up with some really good guesses that turn out to work. Yeah. And you know, for the folks at home, a great example of this is when you're watching golf and and they're telling you how fast the club head is and how fast yep. the ball, that's sports science. You know, it's kind of funny. Um, everybody listening is, is probably actually a scientist. They just didn't know it because they were probably at one point sitting there at home watching a YouTube video of how to do something and analyzing it in their mind of what's the best way to get this thing done. The only difference is you're really capturing this information, putting it in actual data sets, and then mm-hmm. really creating something that you can work off of and prove. Yeah, I mean, the key for all of this is it's not collecting data. Data is important. What makes it work is you actually have to create actionable recommendations that create a change. So data without insight is completely useless. You know that from business metrics, like, okay, great. I got all this data. Now what? Yep. And that was the problem we had to solve in the beginning because there was a lot of friction, to be honest. Um, coaches like, you know, you're you're analyzing what I'm doing. You know, you could get somebody fired. I heard that one. I heard like, this is a waste of time. I heard, you know, uh, you know, you're messing with the game. You know, it's always been done this way. All the things you hear in business too, right? Well, once we were able to use that data and the credit goes to our head football coach, cause he, you know, he really put his job on the line to do. I mean, it was the next, na- the next natural link, but a lot of people are scared to innovate and we innovated and we got an advantage. Uh, I think in business or in sports, when you copy the model, you copy the errors. Everybody's like, oh, I want to do exactly what so-and-so did. Well, great. That's what they did. They've innovated. If they're good at what they do, they've innovated forward and they've realized the mistakes they were making. So you can copy principles, but copying the actual playbook is never a good idea. That That is such a great point. Uh, you know, I think learning from other people's mistakes is important, but truthfully, you know, it's kind of like the uh, what's what's the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing, doing the same over thing over. over and over again, expecting different results. Exactly. And then with data, you know, data is the same thing, right? It's like data will always give you what you want, but it'll never give you what you need. Boom, man. I love that. Man, you and I are friends. I love this. <laughs> I love that. Now, let's get into aim seven. What is aim seven? Tell the listeners, what is it and what does it do? Yeah, so our mission is to empower people to live healthy and impactful lives. And the way that we do that is like right now, there's over a hundred million Americans that own wearable devices like Apple watch Fitbits. The, the actual number is around 125 million. Yep. Apple watch right there I'm on your wrist. Right now. Yep. The reason people wear this for the most part in the health and wellness context is they want to change their behavior. They want to sleep better, exercise more, manage their stress better. But wearables don't change behavior. The research actually demonstrates they do not change long-term behavior. They just measure it. The devices show you data, but they don't tell you exactly how to use it to improve your health and fitness. So AIM7 solves this problem by delivering daily personalized recommendations for your mind, body, and recovery to help you look, feel, and perform your best. So for instance, there's two big parts to this. Acutely, every day, you come into the app, We can tell you based off of the types of exercises that you track and love to do, the perfect type, intensity, how hard, 
and duration you should exercise today based off of how your body is ready to adapt to stress. So just because you go to the gym and you're like, okay, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm going to do this. You write it on paper. You're going to do 50 minutes on your elliptical. Does it mean your body's actually ready for that that day? Because of a lot of things, you could have had a bad night's sleep. You could have gotten in a fight with your spouse and you're all stressed out. Your body's not ready to handle that. So we can give you the precise dose. You literally click a button and we're like, of all the things you do, here's the perfect thing today. From a mental fitness perspective, we assess your psychological state every day and we'll push you real-time interventions to help improve your mood. If you're stressed out, we'll send you a specific tool to use. We also provide you personalized sleep and napping recommendations. And then after seven days, we analyze all your data, just like we would do with an elite athlete. And we're like, here's the one area you should focus on, mind-body recovery. And then we create a little goal for you. And then we help you move it up. We call these different levels, one, two, and three. From a big, giant, 30,000-foot view, if you come into the app, we're going to teach you about something called adaptive capacity. We help teach you how to build the capacity to adapt to more physical and mental stress with less cost. Because I think we would all agree we live in a chaotic, stressful world. And stress is not the enemy. It's really the gateway to growth. It's the only way that you improve. If you want to get fit, you have to exercise. If you want to learn a new skill like SEO we were talking about before, you got to go. It's frustrating, right? But it's the only way that you create these plastic changes in your brain. The problem is, is when stress exceeds your capacity to adapt to it, that's when you get injured. That's when you get burnout. That's when you have mental health issues. So not only do we give you the daily recommendations, we show you the exact thing you need to work on. And then we have basically like a library that's like your masterclass for health and wellness. We curated some of the best experts in the world and everything is curated for busy people that are time poor. Like you got two minutes. You don't have 20 minutes to go to the box and eat quinoa with your bros. Like nothing wrong with CrossFit. We love CrossFitters. I'm just saying like the average American just doesn't have time for that. You got kids, you got busy life. So that's who AIM 7s for. We're serving those 125 million Americans. You know, I think that's a great point is is the time commitment. And and it's true. Like I have, I was, you know, we mentioned it. I'm wearing this Apple Watch and I got the iPhone and it keeps telling me I have this screen time. Okay, the average screen time is four hours this week and five hours this week. What am I supposed to do with this data? Thank you right. for letting me know. I keep looking on my phone, but what am I supposed <laughs> to do? So how does AIM-7, because you kind of mentioned how you're monitoring it and, and you mentioned you know, some of these that give you data points. How does AIM-7 specifically help human performance? Yeah, so... Uh, one of the, I'll just say the differentiator is this, is um, I, right now I'm wearing three devices. Okay. I have a, an aura ring on an Apple watch and a whoop. Okay. Uh, all of which have great data. Um, the other day it was, it was a Saturday last Saturday. I'd had a really hard week of work. I woke up and I was exhausted, right? I was tired, put in a hard week my aura and my whoop were like, you were great today. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I am not ready to go. If I followed those recommendations and went out and had a crazy hard workout session or really pushed myself, whatever, I would have gotten sick or injured. What AIM-7 does is we take objective biometrics from the device and then we use subjective measures. We actually ask you how you feel in seven different areas. And research demonstrates that your perception of how you feel is directly related to biomarkers in your body for those things. So for instance, if I asked you daily how you're stressed, this takes 20 seconds, and we do some really sensitive math in the background. If one day you were like, if for some reason it was exceedingly higher than normal, if we were to take cortisol samples, your cortisol level would be elevated. Same thing for soreness and different things. So we, our algorithms combine subjective and objective measures. And so what we're doing is we're providing you that precise dose of stress that your body's ready for. And then we're giving you the prescription for recovery because the formula for growth is stress plus rest equals growth. And so that is how we're improving overall health and wellness. And we're also pushing you into these buckets, these in that I talk about the levels in the app. That the scientific literature shows it's basically the thresholds you need to hit for physical and mental health. So, for instance, if we can get you just to hit the baseline physical metrics that you need for health, we can increase, we can decrease all cause mortality by 47%. 
You add on regular sleep that's restful and fulfilling, you lowered all-cause mortality by 60%. So we're really addressing the most common preventable lifestyle diseases in America, which are cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, et cetera, which is a four and a half trillion dollar spend every year. You, you know, you mentioned healthcare and that's, that's my area of expertise, right? In fact, mm. you mentioned the aura ring. Yeah. We had radiation oncologists talking about the aura ring years ago because they're trying to encourage their patients to use it, right? To monitor their sleep, monitor their, because then they can also kind of dictate, okay, how well is your body going to uh, tolerate the chemo today or the radiation mm -hmm. today uh, based on these things? Uh, you know, it's, it, the aura ring is very, I'm not trying to promote it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not promoting it. It's a great product. Great I got product. one on right now. Yeah, great, great product. Check it out if you, if you don't, if you haven't heard about it really. In fact, I believe it's owned by Samsung. It's not, it's still, still one of their private babies. It's not even on their public kind of portfolios, I recall, but very interesting. The problem though, is it's just data. They really don't give you recommendations. Yeah. Yep. And so it's like, great. I know I'm sleeping six hours a night. How do I create the conditions for restful and fulfilling sleep? Like we take you through all of this stuff, even to the point of like, we send you a notification in the morning when the sun comes up with a beautiful picture of the sunrise, because one of the, the number one behavior you should engage in to improve sleep, and this is one of the first things we learned in our PhD program, is you have to anchor your circadian clock. And the there are the, there are primary anchors or what are called zeitgebers for the circadian clock, which are light, heat, temperature, food, and exercise. Well, light outside is the primary and strongest one. So just getting some, even if it's the sun is occluded by the clouds. Getting 10 minutes in the morning is going to anchor your clock and it's going to help you get more restful sleep at night. So it's like, it's not just good enough to say you need to do the thing. It's how, when, how much, when my body feels like this, what should I prioritize? And so these devices are great. It's like having a dashboard on your car. Awesome. But it doesn't make you a better driver. <laughs> That's a great point. We've all been on the highways, right? We've all been on the highway. Man, you're starting yeah. to act like my mentor, Dr. Marco Holler, and who is an allergist. But one of the things he told me, you know, when you're traveling international is light therapy. If you're yeah. getting off, you know, a, a long flight, light therapy, because it, it restarts that clock. 100%. Man, Get you so, anchored to your current time zone. Yes, and that's it's, it's phenomenal. Now, so how did you start this business? How did you kind of how did you finance it? How did you kind of roll it out? Well, it started with a thought of just like I wonder if people know how to use these wearables. So a friend of mine, he and I sent out hundreds of surveys to different people we knew at different universities, and they gave it to their students and all sorts of people. And we're like, what do you want out of your wearable? the number one response we got was more energy. If this device could give me more energy, that would be a win. It makes total sense. You think about like the energy market, you know, and then it was stress, sleep, sort uh, stress, sleep, and weight loss. So we wanted to see if we could predict somebody's energy level with Apple watch data and some other unique data sets. And not only could we do that, but we could predict their energy and mood level two days in advance. We had those machine learning algorithms externally validated by some experts at NC State University who are experts in the type of machine learning we used. A friend of mine who's the CEO of a company called Vinley, they do the same thing we do in the car space. And they have the largest car fleets in the world. And uh, this is all, um, it was a lot of, uh, very fortunate. And I, I showed him what I was doing. His name was Mark Hadar. And Mark was like, Eric, you have got something here. So he wrote me a check. and was like, you need to go build this. Now, I've had a 16-year career. I've been very successful. And now I'm going to go, you know, dive in. But I felt called to do this. I felt like this was what I was supposed to do. And so, you know, I have no experience in lean startup methodology. But I start reading books and listening to podcasts. So the first thing I do is run an MVP, which was a text messaging service where we sucked in their data and I sent people recommendations. That did really well. We had paying customers day one. Um, then it was like, okay, how do we turn this into an app? Because we can't do this at scale. Um, built an alpha version. Average thirty average results in the first thirty days. People did thirty eight percent more workouts had 31% less stress. They had almost 10% improvement in sleep. It was crazy. We're like, okay, this is good. Raised some capital. A lot of it was friends and family. Um, 
and I had to go out and start getting talent for the team. And that's, that's probably been one of the keys to success is early on. I didn't have the talent we needed in football. Like if you don't have a quarterback, you're dead. You, you have no shot um, in software development. You got to have elite engineers. And now I have those elite engineers on my team. We've got some, I'm just fired up about who we've got. It's been amazing. We're bringing on more talent. Um, and so now we've deployed this into private beta. Uh, we have paying customers. We have a 94% conversion rate wow. just from seven day free trials. Wow. 80% are staying with us after a month. Um, but that's just the first part of AIM7. We make money three ways. And here's what's really interesting. We found that we can, we're licensing models that we built in this app for B2B health and wellness solutions. So I can't mention names right now, but there's an international gym franchise with over 1,700 locations worldwide. We did a, pi- a beta test and our platform solution improved their conversion rates by 50% over five months, which is an, equaling about $125,000 per location. So we just rolled that out this week to studios in Houston and Austin, and we're going to start expanding that. And then where our um, long-term value is, is with agreements with enterprise payers like insurance companies. Because if we can demonstrate that we can help people, it's a behavior change oh, product. Yeah. Yep. If we can demonstrate that, which we're already starting to show, we just got to have the large enough model. Who wouldn't say, I've got an Apple Watch on. I'll take a massive cut of my insurance premium. AIM7, is it's not just tracking. They're helping me get there. Guess what? You've lowered risk for everybody. You pay less. It costs, you know, it's less risk for them. And that's where our, our enterprise value is at. Man, that is one of the most sexiest things I have heard in a while, because honestly, the healthcare space is so huge. Insurance space is huge. Um, You're you're talking about value-based care right now, right? And so Mm -hmm. when you do a procedure, you do a surgical procedure, uh, value-based care is essentially saying, hey, we shouldn't be seeing this patient back with the same issue for a long period of time. And we need individuals like you uh, in the healthcare space to kind of help support that. In fact, I think one area that might be interesting is actually look at employers like the Columbia yeah, oh, Sports, the Nikes, right? Because put that in their benefit package, right? They have the employee wellness packages, and now you're now you're really cooking. You're dictating our roadmap right here, <laughs> uh, and that's fine. That's exactly what we're going to do. I mean, I know a lot of people. It, it the scale of AIM Seven is enormous, um, but to me, it goes back to our mission empowering people to live healthy and impactful lives. If we believe that if we can help you be healthy, then you can live a life of impact, whatever area that is. And so you're exactly right, whether that's going to Walmarts or the Amazons, <clears throat> which we have plans to do. Um, w- but if we deliver on the fundamental premise of AIM7, we are giving you daily personalized recommendations that help change behavior and improve your health. Like that's powerful. And so um, we love the apples and Fitbits. Actually, the head of Fitbit for Google is on our advisory board. Oh, wow. Because he's like, you guys are that data intelligence layer. We don't compete with them. We make their product more valuable. And then we drive value for our customers. So um, it's really what's called a double Metcalf loop. We create value for the customers and for all the data that comes in. We're hardware uh, and and data agnostic. So um, we have a really big vision for AIM7 but we're just trying to be very focused right now on how we execute on that. Yeah. It makes sense. Start with those core competencies first and kind of growing from there. And in fact, you know, folks, I, I hope you're really listening because one of the things I have been stating in this podcast, I think pretty consistently the last couple of months is the value, right? Mm. The perception of value and how do you create value? What Eric's doing right here, it, it's phenomenal creating value for the consumers, but also creating value for Fitbit for Apple because they're going to be like, oh, yeah, now I do want that. I'm telling you, now I'm going to go buy the Aura watch. I've been thinking about buying it, and I think you convinced me. I'm going to have to get rid of the wedding ring and put the Aura ring on now. And, That's and, what I do. My yeah, wife's I'm cool with it. And, it, it and Gabriel, I'll give, you a, uh, I'll give you a free AIM7 subscription, and so once you throw that in, you'll be able to hop on and make use of it. Oh, I'm in. I, I jump on the Peloton. I got like 10 workouts this month because to your point, I got two kids. I got a 10-week-old, and I got a three-year-old. And Oh, man, my goodness. Time is Congratulations, limited. by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I'm surprised I still have the hair, to be honest yeah, with you. I don't. I don't. <laughs> yeah, because you have three boys. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more about my genetics than anything else. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you're 
you're starting this, this is a new industry, right? Sports uh, science is relatively new. How difficult was it to start really where they're, you're kind of the pioneer and a, you're kind of creating a pioneer and a new frontier? Yeah, it's hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. It was hard starting sports science in sports. You know, a lot of skeptics. No, but it was a lonely. I used to actually be on Nike's performance council for five years. And I heard uh, Tinker Hatfield speak once. It was a small closed door meeting. Tinker Hatfield is the one that des- designed uh, Air Jordan. And he said, if you want to be a creator, if you want to, you know, change things, be prepared to be alone. And that just hit me between the eyes because I've always felt alone and uh, swimming upstream. And so this is just another extension of that. Now I have another team of lunatics that, you know, <laughs> we all believe that and, and we're, you know, the Apple kind of thing, you know, here's to the, you know, the, you know, the, the crazy ones. Right. Um, I think it's when I talk to people about this, though, they get it. It, it doesn't take very long. They're like, yeah, a hundred percent. I I can go meet anybody on the street with an Apple watch or a Fitbit. And I'm like, it's just data. And their head is nodding. Right. Uh, so for me, you know, you sent me a question in advance, like what keeps you up at night? I actually sleep pretty good at night. It's what wakes me up early. You know, I'm, I get up early ready to go because I want to deliver for our customers. One of our core values is stewardship. I want to deliver for our investors. I want to be a good steward of the money that they've invested. And I want to build an industry defining product and continue to build a world-class team. And so every day I wake up and I'm, I'm just ready to go. Um, doesn't mean I'm not tired. Doesn't mean, you know, I'm a real human being just like everybody else. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for aim seven, you know, actually building these algorithms and like taking my own recommendations, I'd be a freaking wreck, uh, because of the stress. This is a tremendous amount of stress. And, um, I've had to learn to invest a lot in my mental fitness as I've really taken a deep dive on that. And we've brought in some world leading experts on the subject. Like I invest in my own mental health a lot more than I used to. Um, and so it's really been a, a journey of helping others and self-exploration. You know, that's, that's a great point. And, and, you know, you mentioned, uh, entrepreneurship sometimes is a very lonely path, mm-hmm. right? You, you spend time by yourself and sometimes people don't understand it because you have this passion. And I think what you're hitting right now is your zone of genius, right? Where something that you're probably doing and you don't even know the time just kind of ticks away. Next, you know, it's midnight because you're just kind of engrossed into what you're doing. But have you ever had a moment of self doubt? Oh my gosh. Of course. Um, I, I, one of the things that we really focusing in on, and we're actually building a new series on this in the app is on leading yourself because 90% of what the, the thoughts that go on your head are subconscious. You really don't control them. When you train to awareness and you understand where your thought patterns are, then you can direct your thought process to a positive action, directed towards a positive outcome. It's a fool's errand to think that you can control the future. Uh, if that was the case, there'd be gajillion, there'd be four billion billionaires on the planet, right? It just doesn't happen. But you can take your best shot. And so, um, you know, that's one thing that I've just really focused on a lot is like trying to control that, that, that dialogue between my own ears. And when I start getting negative, cause everybody does directed towards, you know, for me, my faith is really important. I have a strong community. I engage with other people. I share burdens with others. I, I don't keep it inside. I'll go talk to my wife. I'll go talk to my friends. Don't want to be a complainer. Rather, it's like, hey, here's what I'm going through. Would you, would you, you know, would you walk through this with me? And that's one of the five pillars for building adaptive capacity is community. And so I have to live that out, right? And um, and it's really cool to do that in an authentic way. That's a great point. And you know, in fact, you mentioned community, and one of the things I now put on my tagline when I send out people questions and kind of get them ready is. A former guest says, you know, if, if our community members aren't doing well, our economy never will. Mm. And I thought that was very, very, very true. Now, you know, you've, you've 
you're growing this AIM-7. You've started in the sports science world was, again, very new. How do you market yourself? How do you brand something that is so novel? Yeah, so um, three things right now as far as go-to-market strategy on the B2C side. So I have a podcast called The Blueprint. Uh, I started this in mid-2020 before we really didn't have a product, early 2020. And we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills, and we could say a simple tactic. So it's 15-minute episodes. Same audience that I'm curating for AIM-7. So I, I, I started reading some marketing stuff about, like, go build the audience first. So now we got about 15,000 downloads a month, and it's growing pretty good. Um, now, that alone is not going to drive our entire business. But what we do is, like, and so right now I'm on a podcast tour, right? My friend Sam Corcos, the CEO of Levels Health, I asked him, like, how did you build this massive waiting list? And he was like, podcast tour. Go right to the audience that needs to hear this message. So we're uh, going out and, and reaching out to specific audiences. One of them is entrepreneurs. Another is people that are specifically focused on health and wellness and parents, busy parents, right? So I'm doing 100 podcasts this year. It's a great way to get right in front of your audience because they're, they're already interested in the subject. Then we direct them back to the top of funnels. They go from there to usually they'll sign up for the product or they'll start following on um, AIM7 you know, dot com, they'll go to our newsletter or they'll follow me on social media or my writing or whatever. Um, also, we're doing ambassador marketing. So we call it community hunting. We're not paying for paid social. We're leveraging people that already have audiences that are already interested and we're paying them for conversion and we pay them well. And so we do, we're not in the app store right now. So what we're doing is we're in private beta and it's a very white glove experience for our customers, meaning they get uh, four Zoom calls in the first month. It's $15. This is an expensive product. And um, that ambassador, if we do a cohort with that ambassador, that ambassador joins. So now they get to be with like their favorite, you know, whoever it is in that area and me and my team talking about these things. Plus they get the experience in the app and it builds our community. And so we're really focused on building this red hot community and then going to the app store. So it's, those are, those are the, that's kind of the top of funnel, like how we're doing it from a B2C side from a B2B perspective, um, we're really focused on this for the next like 12 months, really focused on this specific franchise that we're in because we can hit a significant amount of MRR with small market penetration, build really good algorithms because it's a platform solution. And then we can use parts of that for other solutions. Um, so we're not paying for advertising. We want this to be an organic thing. And we want to have a groundswell. And so we're starting, we're trying to identify the red hot communities that really catch on to this and it'll grow. That's, that's a great strategy. In fact, you know, for folks listening at home, I would leverage this marketing. This is exactly what I do as well. Leverage the, the free advert like Eric, how much did you pay to be on this podcast today? Nothing, <laughs> nothing. Exactly. That's free advertisement. And guess what? I'm going to be putting AIM 7, which is a great opportunity to let everybody know to subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. You can do that by visiting theshadesofe.com because we will have this information on the newsletter. Again, Eric coming out doing this is the same thing other entrepreneurs can do. Networking is free. Jumping on other people's podcasts is free. Writing a newsletter is free. These are all things that you can do. You right should be now. a prolific digital writer, by the way. Sorry to cut you off. No. It's free. Yep. Like you need content, don't you, for your show? Correct. Right? Like I just had uh, Carmine Gallo on, the guy that wrote the Bezos Blueprint, Talk Like Ted. You know, communication is one thing we talk about, right? Uh, Kelly Starrett just really is doing a book tour, right? These people need to get on shows. Yep. So like if you have a compelling story around something that delivers value for people, like start with the value that you're going to be able to deliver to somebody and then go create a compelling pitch and go hire an EA to go do a, you know, go through a campaign. That's how I got in your show. It's very true. It's very true. Yeah. I got an executive assistant an email from an EA said, Hey, I got Dr. Eric Corman interested in being on your show. Let's do it. Let's get it going. Sent me some. And hopefully I delivered. <laughs> and then, but then the value, right? The value yeah. back. Because again, the entire intent of this podcast is also to create value to these entrepreneurs. How did individuals build their mm -hmm. multi million dollar or hundred thousand dollar company? Because it's important to also understand that 
this this these perfectly curated social media accounts aren't truthfully uh, accurate of what the entrepreneurship life is. It's lonely. There are very long nights. You can go broke. <laughs> you know, there mm-hmm. are these different things that you kind of have to go down now. What would you, what, what advice, you know, you've been doing this now for several years. What advice would you have for other entrepreneurs that are, or aspiring entrepreneurs? Go test your idea before you actually go all in. Like make sure that people actually want the thing that you think that they want. Um, I did that. I, I validated that there was a need for what we did for what we've done. You know, I think that's the number one, number one mistake. Number two, get a co-founder unless it's like a, an educational business or it's something where you're the expert or, or you have the skills. If you're doing anything technically related, I do think it's helpful to have a co-founder because now you are not alone. You share the burden, especially if like maybe you're doing marketing and you're the face and they're the technical expert. Like that's a wonderful partnership right there. Um, I would also say like, go get paying customers ASAP, unless like start with paying customers because that'll validate whether this thing's real or not. If people aren't willing to pay for it, then it's not going to work. Um, and you know, was it Reed Hoffman says, if you're not embarrassed of the first version of the thing you put out, you launch too late. So I, that's a perfection is the enemy of getting this thing done. And I'm still, you know, have these ideas of what this is going to become. And then like, we get these stories back or people are like, I've been losing weight or my heart resting heart rate went down 10 beats this month, or I'm a more present parent. And you're like, the version of what you're doing is good enough. It's making an impact and it's only going to get better and better and better and better if you serve, 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 serve. So, you know, if you're not embarrassed of the first version, it's you're way too late to the game. Man, that is a great point. In fact, folks, if, if you want to see some embarrassment, just go listen to the first like 50 episodes versus the last 50 episodes. There you uh, go. It's a huge, <laughs> huge learning point. In fact, shout out to my neighbor who, uh, Jeremy Inman, first guest on the show, who literally came in the basement and was like, all right, let's do this podcast. I'm like, I don't think I'm ready. He's like, you're ready. You're either you, you know, shit or get off the pot kind of thing. There and, you go. And, and we did it. And now here we are over 100 episodes later. Uh, and and it's, it's just continuing the crime. And I think that's a great point. One, just, just getting out there and trying it and, and misery loves company, you know, uh, finding the co-founder, I think is a very important uh, aspect too, because it's, it's, it, it is a lonely, lonely road, but, uh, there are other people out there. In fact, there's probably somebody out there right now that wants you to succeed more than anybody you've ever met in your entire life. You just got to go meet them. Amen. Love that. So Eric. Give the folks at home, where can they find you if they want to learn more about AIM7, website, social site? How can they get in contact with you? Yeah, AIM7.com, A-I-M-7. Sign up. We'd love to have you in the beta, free trial for seven days. Uh, The Blueprint's another place to get plugged in. It's for busy people. Uh, Like I said, cutting edge science, leadership, and life skills. And then um, on all social media platforms, it's at Eric Corum. At Eric Corum. That's K. O-R-E-M. And again, this information will be on the newsletter. So again, go ahead and plug the newsletter. Visit the shadesofe.com. You can also follow us on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook at the Shades of E. And please subscribe to the podcast at the Shades of Entrepreneurship. Eric, is there any last words you would like to let the listeners know? I would just say, hey, look, like you're not alone. Life is hard. Find a community. And then, you know, if you, if you're using a wearable, like make sense of it, you know what I'm saying? Or honestly, just get rid of it because it will cause you more heartache than it will, you know, anything else. Just staring at these numbers and not knowing what to do. And AIM 7's here to serve you and walk along this journey. And I'm just, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be here today. No, thank you so much for coming on. I really do appreciate a lot of great information. So folks, I really do hope you had the pen and pad out today. Dr. Eric Corman. Aim seven, such a very phenomenal product. I'm I'm looking forward to getting to it. I'm gonna I'm telling you right now. I'm gonna tell the wife I'm buying the Aura Watch. I don't care what you say. I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it. Thank you so much for those folks listening at home. Please subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship on where you listen to podcasts or visit theshadesofe.com. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.